Um, the reading today is from 1 Peter 1, 13 to 2, 10. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As his obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable Though through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a cornerstone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Okay, I'm going to pray, and then uh, we're going to have a look at uh, what this passage teaches us. Father, we just want to thank you, and we acknowledge that your greatness is such that no one can fathom, and your wisdom is such that you consult no one for advice. Um, Father, we thank you that you haven't left us to our own devices. We thank you that we don't have to try and speculate, try to imagine Uh, what you are like and what your will is for mankind and for us. Uh, We thank you that we have a trustworthy, reliable word. We thank you for your intervention and the record of that intervention into human history. And we pray, Father, that as we turn our attention to it, that each one of us would find it profitable and helpful. Uh, Father, it's very easy for us to listen and not hear and look, not see. We pray that we would give our attention and be focused this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Roman emperor Nero smeared many of them with pitch, crucified them, and then set them alight. He accused them of being atheists because they refused to bow down and worship him as God. He referred to them as cannibals because Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. 
He also accused them of being ars not arsonists, revolutionaries, because they believed that one day God would destroy the earth. Now, the Roman historian, not the Jewish historian, a Roman historian, Tacitus, said this, Nero put forward as guilty and afflicted with the most exquisite punishments those who were hated for their abominations and called Christians by the populace. After scenes of great cruelty, the Roman people began to feel sorry for the Christians whom they believed were suffering unjustly to gratify the cruelty of Nero. The thought of being torn apart by wild dogs, crucified and burned, was enough to panic the bravest soul. Now, there's no questions, friends, that news of these barbaric and callous persecutions of Christians in Rome spread quickly throughout the Roman Empire, where many Christians were living and trying to make their way in life. And so the Apostle Peter, who would, uh, who would die under Nero's watch, under Nero's watch, wrote a letter instructing believers how to live in the midst of persecution, in the midst of hostility, in the midst of difficulty and hardship, knowing that similar persecutions would soon come to the Roman provinces. So the historical context of 1 Peter, friends, is Christians trying to live out their lives, Christians trying to live for Jesus in a very hostile, antagonistic, callous, brutal environment. An environment where you can be accused unjustly, crucified horrifically, and burned simply for being a Christian, simply for being a believer in Jesus. Peter's trying to make the impress on his readers that by living in obedience to Jesus Christ, a Christian can be a powerful evangelistic tool in the hands of Almighty God. And so we read in verse 13, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Now, the high-profile Bible teacher Howard Hendricks in his book, Living by the Word, states that every major cult is built on the violation of the principle of context. Let me say that again. Every major cult is built on the violation of of the principle of context. And that's just literary context. There are others. That's just literary context. And so when we read the word therefore, when we read the word therefore, we must take into consideration the preceding context because what Peter has recorded is based on what he has already recorded. Biblical sentences, friends, are only truly understood. Biblical sentences are only accurately understood in relation to preceding and succeeding context. Now, conceded, this may seem a bit basic, a little fundamental, a rudimentary perhaps, but let me assure you, friends, there are many who ignore it. There are many who ignore it, and therefore perverting and distorting the Bible is the end result. And when you distort or pervert the Bible, you pervert and distort the words of God. Now, after recording the postal addresses of the believers in verses 1 and 2, referring to them as elect exiles, Peter in verse 3 and 4 focuses their concentration on praising God in light of their circumstances, in light of their persecutions and troubles. He focuses their concentration on praising God for giving them a new birth into a living hope and into an inheritance that will never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven. And even though for a short time they may have to suffer tr trials of various kinds, verse 6 and 7, the believers possessed what the prophets spoke about and what angels longed to look into, verses 10, 11 and 12. So that's your literary context, you see. So Peter's intended readership were to praise God for their great and glorious and wonderful salvation. And in doing so, in doing so, he takes their eyes off their circumstances, off their situations, off their persecutions and hardships and troubles, and 
onto an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven. And it was secured for them, as the text records, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter diverts their attention off their temporal experience and onto their eternal inheritance. Now, there's no question, friends, life can beat you up, bust you up, and break you down. And as a consequence, you become preoccupied with your experience. You become preoccupied with your temporary experience. The here and now dominates your thinking. And the there and then, that is your eternal inheritance, can easily get lost. Sort of fades into the background, as it were. Therefore, if you want to be one of those joyful Christians in the midst of persecutions and troubles and hardships, if you want to be one of those victorious Christians, then you must understand God's eternal provision. Although we are aliens, how the Bible refers to us, exiles in this world and treated with contempt because we simply do not conform, the reality is we are citizens of heaven. If you're a believer... You're a citizen of heaven, and we must therefore look beyond our earthly experiences, our earthly troubles, beyond our earthly struggles, to an inheritance that is eternal, never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven. And if you can discipline yourself to do that, if you can discipline yourself to do that, your only response can, can be praising God. Praising God. That's why Peter uh, can say in verse 3, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking to Christians. He's referring to Christians who are being persecuted, harassed, burned. Verse 6, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Verse 7, these have come so that, you're proved, so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, friends, the advice, look to the Lord, uh, can sometimes be used by Christians as a sort of cheap throwaway line uh, to avoid getting involved in people's hardships and and troubles, but rightly understood and rightly implied, it enshrines, it it encapsulates a truth that can be profoundly liberating. Profoundly liberating, resulting in verse 8, inexpressible and glorious joy. So with minds that are alert and fully sober, we are to set our hope on the grace to be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. I don't know about you, but I always watch with interest and a little concern people who are walking along using their mobile phones in public. I always think to myself, it's an accident right to happen right there, right there. And that's simply because they're not alert to the dangers around them, are they? They're not aware. Inattention can kill you. They're not aware. One wonders how many road accidents have occurred and how many people have been killed simply because people weren't aware, inattention, not being alert. Well, Peter instructs the believers in verse 13, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, if you have a King James version of the Bible, verse 13 reads this. Gird up the loins of your mind. (laughs) Gird up the loins of your mind. You say, what? Gird up the loins of your mind. What is in view here, friends, is the ancient practice of lifting up your robes and tucking them into your belt when you need to run. This practice is also seen in Luke 15 when the father sees his lost son return and the father sees his son from a distance. What does he do? He runs towards him. In other words, he lifted up his robe, tucked him into his belt and ran towards his son and welcomes him home. And here in verse 13, this practice 
is what they call metaphorically applied to our thinking, to our processes, our thought process. Therefore, we are to be alert. We are to pull in all the loose ends of our thinking, pull them in by not allowing ourselves to be distracted as we focus on the future grace of God. And being fully sober means that a Christian is to be characterised by clarity of mind and moral decisiveness, which I think, think is an awesome challenge, is an incredible challenge because there are so many moral dilemmas and so many things that are not black and white, they're grey. So to be morally decisive is a major challenge. So be alert. Be a sober-minded Christian. Don't, don't have poor impulse control. Don't lack self-control. Don't get intoxicated by the enticements and the inducements and the, the lures of this world. Or if you're one of Peter's intended readerships, you know, um, readership, you're not to be someone who was controlled and de determined by opposition and harassment and persecution. Friends, it's very easy to become introspective, is it not? It's very easy to become introspective when you're being harassed, when you're being opposed, when you're being persecuted. You know, you pity yourself, end up saying, woe is me, that type of attitude. But be alert. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. Our citizenship is in heaven. Pull in all the loose ends of your thinking. Do what verse 13 tells us to do. Set your hope on the grace, the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So in light of our wonderful and great salvation, Christians, regardless of ages and stages, regardless of country and cultures, are without reservation, live for the future. We are to anticipate the consummation, the culmination of our salvation when Jesus Christ comes at his second coming. Someone once said, if you can't see through your troubles, try seeing over them. Try seeing over them. You see, being a faithful Christian witness is not easy. The Australian um, evangelist John Chapman used to say the first 40 years are the hardest. <laughs> um, but when you encounter opposition and persecution and harassment, the temptation to withdraw and form a subculture to protect, to protect ourselves is great. Some scholars refer to this as the holy huddle or the frozen chosen. It's part of the reason why monastic societies come into being, you know, monasteries, the monastic movement. You see, we develop a natural introspective focus. We do. We develop a natural introspective focus of support and love to protect each other. And yet throughout this first epistle, Peter is constantly reminding us not to become introspective, not to become preoccupied with our own situations and our own states. You see, friends, the power of the gospel reveals itself in the strength and meaningfulness and depth of our relationships, not in superficial friendliness, that conceals a, difference, a distance. And certainly, definitely not in our, not to the expense of our witness and our ministry and our outreach to the world. No matter how bad it gets, we are to resist the temptation to become introspective. We resist the temptation to build a fortress, a mentality. Because if we do not, we simply become a society of people talking to ourselves. We simply become a society of people doing life together, talking to ourselves, rather than, as we are going, making disciples of all nations. So pull in all the loose ends of your thinking. Abandon anything that hinders your forward progress and don't allow yourself to be distracted. The Christian life, as you would know, friends, is not a sprint over in 10 seconds. It's a marathon. It's a lifelong marathon. 
And our hope is to run the race and win the prize. So that we, verse 13, set our hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. You know, in the 2004 Athens Olympic Games, uh, an American competitor by the name of Matt Emmons allowed himself to be distracted and it cost him the gold medal. Matt Emmons was competing in the 50-metre rifle uh, and he was in first place. And all he needed to do with his last shot was something near the bullseye. Just That's all he needed to do, something near the bullseye. So Matt Edmonds, Emmons takes his rifle. He walks into his lane. He takes his stand. He aims and he fires. But his shot didn't register. It didn't register on the target, on the scoreboard. You see, Matt Edmonds, friends, was standing in the wrong lane. He was standing in lane three when he should have been standing in lane two. He went to the wrong lane, aimed at the wrong target. The judge's score was zero, and he went from first place to eighth place. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. Pull in all those distractions. Pull in all the loins, those loose ends of your thinking. Set your hope on the grace of God to be revealed. Someone has been recorded as saying that many Christians are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I don't know where that comes from. Because I think the opposite is true. I think the opposite is true. I think many of us Christians are so preoccupied with the present world that we no longer think of heaven. We have an abundance of what we want in the here and now. We have an abundance of what we desire in the here and now. And I think a significant contributing factor to this earthly preoccupation is the health, wealth, peace, prosperity that many churches, a number of churches preach and teach. In the name of Jesus, you know, you can name it, you can claim it. Correct me if I'm wrong, I thought the Christian life was about self-sacrifice, not self-indulgence. I thought the Christian life was about dying to yourself and living for Jesus. I thought the Christian life was about taking up your cross and following Jesus from the flogging post through the streets of Jerusalem to the execution site. Paul impresses this truth on the believers at Philippi. He says this, Our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await, we eagerly expect a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the Colossian believers, he said this, Since you have been raised with Christ, set your mind on, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So our actions and our decisions, friends, should reflect heavenly priorities, not earthly indulgences. And so we read further in verse uh, in 1 Peter 14, 15 and 16. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, if I was to ask you to define the word holy or holiness for me, I think I would get back a number of different definitions. Uh, and as I mentioned some weeks ago, holiness is often equated with a series of prohibitions. You know, um, holiness is not drinking alcohol. Holiness is not dancing. Holiness is not playing cards. Holiness is not play, uh, going to the movies. Not smoking. But when you comply with this understanding of holiness, you become like the Pharisees. You really do. You become like a Pharisee with your list of do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs. When verse 15, you'll notice, records, be holy in all that you do. All that you do. So there's not a second that goes by when a Christian ought not be holy. All that you do. There's not a thing that you do when you shouldn't do it 
to be holy or being holy. In fact, every facet of life, every aspect of life, the Christian is to be holy. Be holy in all that you do. Why? Because God is holy. Jesus is holy. So holiness in this context means you're a nonconformist. And you'll notice here, friends, verse 14 and 15, is the Apostle Paul defining holiness for us. And what he does here, he does it by contrast. The Bible often does this. The more I read the Bible, the more I notice it. You get contrast in the Bible. And this is what Peter does. He defines holiness by contrast. He says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But... Just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all that you do. Verse 16, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. So holiness in this context, friends, is being a nonconformist to the way in which you used to live. So there needs to be a transitional point. And that transition needs to be going for the rest of your days. Holiness in this context is being a nonconformist. It's living in contrast to the way you, you used to live. It's living in contrast to the evil desires. It's living in contrast to being ignorant. One could say uh, to live a holy life is to live in conformity with the will of God and in contrast to the sinful practices you used to, in the way you used to live or you were committed to before you became a believer. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, we Christians greatly enjoy talking about the provision of God and how he defeated sin on the cross and how he gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us and how all the perfect demands of God's holiness were met in the crucifixion death of Jesus. But friends, God demands exceedingly more than we just acknowledge or talk about his holiness. He demands that we be holy, verse 15, be holy in all that you do, verse 16, because I am holy. Now, the wise man Ecclesiastes tells us that there's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. There's a time to dance and there's a time to mourn. There's a time to be silent and there's a time to speak. But there's no time, not one second, when a Christian ought not be holy. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. You see, holiness is not, is not some you know, spiritual luxury uh, that, uh, that, that's relevant for a few Christians of a bygone era. Christians of all ages and stages, cultures and countries are called on to be holy. There's no, there's no exceptions here. There's no exclusions. From my observation, I think, I think Christians in Australia have what, what, what we call a culturally conditioned holiness. Culturally conditioned holiness. And what we do, we adapt and we conform to the character and the behaviour patterns of those around us. As our culture is more or less holy, so we become more or less holy. But the issue right here, friends, is God is not called on us to be like those around us. He's called on us to be like himself. Be holy because I am holy. So we are not to reflect the likeness of our culture. We are to reflect the likeness of our creator. Be holy because I am holy. So our distinctiveness, our set-apartness, our contrastingness, if you will, our holiness is to be based upon the character of God, not based upon the behaviour or the character of those around us. And I would submit that if there's no desire in our hearts, if there's no energy, if there's no motivation in our hearts to be holy, then you really need to seriously question whether your faith in Jesus is genuine. You really do. If you have no desire, no energy, no motivation 
for holiness, it's questionable as to whether you've understood the gospel. And therefore, you need to go back there. Jesus in his death and resurrection, crucifixion, death and victorious resurrection, pays the penalty for our sin and he takes the punishment for our sin. And therefore, if you truly believe that, then you would have a desire, a motivation, an energy to abandon sin, to forsake sin. In other words, to be holy. Not merely once, but for the rest of your life. As someone once said to me just recently, present, continuous. Friends, it's very easy to deceive yourself into thinking that you're Christian when you're not. And it's very easy to deceive deceive others into thinking that you're Christian when you're not. Being holy is part of the reason why you're a Christian, why the Christian was chosen, why the Christian is saved. Ephesians 1, 4 states, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy. It's part of the reason why you were chosen. Holy and blameless. So we conclude, therefore, to live an unholy life is to live in a way that's diametrically opposed to the purpose for which you were saved. Diametrically opposed to the purpose for which God chose you. See, at the end of the day, true salvation brings with it a desire to be holy. Now, if you're a Christian, and I am Christian, there ought to be a family resemblance, a family likeness. Some of you are looking a bit nervous at this point. Now, when I say that, friends, I'm not referring to, you know, your hair should start to thin out, you know. This is not a physical likeness. It's not a psychological likeness. It's not a genetic likeness. It's a spiritual likeness. There ought to be a family resemblance, a family likeness, if you're a Christian. Peter in verse 14 refers to Christians as obedient children. So through the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, if you're a Christian, you've been adopted into God's family and you have God as your father. So there ought to be a family resemblance, likeness that shows what God the Father is like. When people look at you, they should see some similarities to Jesus. And this becomes clear in verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. Be holy because I am holy. You know, Alexander the Great uh, lived in three, was born in 356 BC. And he was one of the greatest military leaders and strategists the world has ever known. In 15 years of conquest, he never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. He was ruthless, dictatorial, and ambitious to the point that he regarded himself as divine. One day, it was brought to his attention that one of his soldiers was a deserter. The soldier feared for his life, and in the midst of the battle, in the heat of the battle, he ran away, ran away, and then was brought before the king. Alexander asked the young soldier, what is your name? The soldier replied, my name is Alexander. Alexander the Great became angry, and he said with a loud voice, change your behavior or change your name. Change your behavior or change your name. If you're going to bear my name, then that name must bear a family resemblance. Why should we be holy? Well, that's simply because God is holy. Our Father is holy. We are his children. He is our Father. He is holy. We should be holy. We should have a desire in our hearts to be holy. And a lack of holiness reflects on who we represent. It really does. A lack of holiness reflects on who we represent. So be holy in all that you do because God is holy. Amen.